let's just close in prayer, huh? Man, that was, uh, uh, thank you for all, all of you who submitted videos. And I just want to extend uh, my Mother's Day greeting to you. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. We're so excited to celebrate with you. But as Lynette said, we know that Mother's Day is sort of a double-edged sword for some people. There are those who um, wanted to be moms and, and haven't been, those who have had to say goodbye to their moms. And, and so we want to rejoice with those who rejoice and also mourn with those who mourn. And today stirs up all sorts of those kinds of emotions. And we just want you to know wherever you're at, you are welcome here and we see you. We see you. You know, um, it might surprise you, but I don't do a lot of the cooking in my household. But there are a few things that I really enjoy cooking. And one of those things is chili, which means that for Mother's Day, Kelly is getting a nice pot of chili, extra spicy. Extra, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I, I do like making chili, and I like participating in a chili cook-off every once in a while. And um, it seems like if you're in a chili cook-off, everybody has like a secret ingredient that they include. Right? So if you like their chili, they say something like, you're never going to guess what's in there. <laughs> you're like, try me. <laughs> Beans, meat, what? You know, and so, you know, some people put like cinnamon in their chili or so. You, there's a whole lot of things that people put in their chili, but there's this like secret ingredient that just takes it over the top. And I have a secret ingredient that I put in my chili. Do you want to know what it is? One person does. That's enough for me. Okay. Um, <laughs> here's what I put in my chili. I put Campbell's cheddar cheese in my chili. All you haters, stop. <laughs> I'll have you know that my chili has gotten runner-up, not once, but twice in chili cook-offs. So, I mean, you just put a little bit, you're like, it would have been better if it won. Well, it didn't, and I'm not a liar, so runner-up. And so you just put a little bit this, not, put the whole thing in at the very end, stir it around, and oh, the chili is so creamy. And here's the thing about a secret ingredient. It doesn't stand out. It's not the star of the show. It's subtle. It's in the background, but it's often the thing that just makes it pop and takes it over the top. I think the lives that are flourishing, lives that are thriving, most of them have a, a secret ingredient, something that you may not see just on the surface, but that's there, that's sort of like a, a fertilizer for the soul that allows the soul to flourish and to thrive and to grow. And today I want to tell you what that secret ingredient is. If you have your Bible, will you open with me to Acts chapter 11 as we continue our series, Not So New, Not So Normal. As you're turning there to Acts chapter 11, let me just give you a little bit of context for where we're going to be picking up the story today. You see, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus gave the church a command. He said, go therefore into all the nations, okay? And he said, go to Jerusalem, Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, carrying the good news of the gospel. But the church got comfortable in Jerusalem, and so they needed a little nudge to step outside the walls of Jerusalem and... The Lord brought that nudge in the form of persecution. Look at the way that Acts chapter 11, starting in verse 9 reads, or 19, I'm sorry, reads, says this. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, and Stephen was the first martyr of the church. You can read about that in Acts chapter 7. He was stoned because of his faith in Jesus and died in the streets. And so the church is scattered because of him, and they traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to Hellenists also preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Now, notice this, that there is persecution that comes that starts to launch the church outward. So the church is in pain, the church is reeling, the church is probably asking all sorts of questions like, God, what are you up to? And God, what are you doing? And yet we see the sovereign hand of God continuing to move the church forward. And not only that, we see in verse 21 that the Lord was with them. 
So please catch this. I don't know what you're walking through today, but I just want you to hear that the pain that you're walking through doesn't mean that the presence of God is absent. He is in the thick of it with you, just like he was with this early church. And it says that the church starts to take root in Antioch. And that was no small accomplishment. Antioch was the third most prominent city in the Roman Empire behind behind Rome first and then behind Alexandria. It was an important city, in many ways a melting pot where people from all over the world came to live. And we see that the church starts preaching the gospel not just to Jews but also to Gentiles. Now remember, the gospel was first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. But we see right now that the church in Acts chapter 11 is at a crossroads. They're starting to see people who aren't Jews respond to the gospel. They're starting to see people come to faith in Jesus. And they're starting to have all of these questions that begin to arise. We'll talk about more of them next week. But like, is it, is it possible for somebody who's not first Jewish to become a Christian? Is that okay? Are these people legitimate believers? What what do we do with this? The church is taking a little bit of a different direction than we thought it might. They're at a crossroads. You see, and it's in times of transition, times of movement, times where things aren't quite what they're going to be and they aren't what they were that are really, really challenging, aren't they? So what happens in the midst of this crossroads that they face in Antioch? Well, verse 22, here's what happens. The report came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent whom? Barnabas to Antioch. Now that may not seem like all that big of a deal to you, but this is not the first time we've met Barnabas in the book of Acts. He actually showed up for the very first time in Acts chapter 4. And listen to what happened in that occasion. It says, thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles, what? Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So when the early church is just getting started, When they're starting to pool their money together to take care of one another in the midst of a bloody empire who's one of the very first people that sells a field and says, I'm in. Who is it? Barnabas. And it was such a significant move that they say, this guy's going by Job, but I don't think that's his name. Let's call him something else. Let's call him son of encouragement. And everybody goes, yeah, that fits. That fits. I mean, can you imagine having your name changed to son of encouragement and everybody looks on and goes, yeah, that fits. That fits. But it's not the last time that we see Barnabas before Acts chapter 11. We also saw him in Acts chapter 9. It says this, and when he, and the he here is the apostle Paul, although he's not called Paul yet, he's called Saul. When he had come to Jerusalem and he attempted to join the disciples and they were all afraid of him for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But any guesses who shows up? But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he'd seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. I mean, think about how important this moment is in the development of the early church. What would have happened if the disciples had said, we've got no use for Paul? What would have happened if they said, no, 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 he was responsible for Stephen's death. We, we can't, we can't link arms with Paul? No way. And yet, it's Barnabas who stands in between the disciples who are saying, nope. And in between Saul, who's called by God to be one of the first carriers of the message of the gospel to the Gentiles, and it's Barnabas, son of encouragement, who shows up. Commentator William Barclay called Barnabas the man with the biggest heart in the church. I mean, how cool would it be to be renamed son of encouragement? 
It's really interesting. See, Barnabas makes these almost cameo type appearances at really key moments in the development of the early church. When they're forming community, Barnabas is there. When the Apostle Paul is called, Barnabas is there. When there's tension in the church at Antioch, Barnabas is there. I would argue that Barnabas is the secret ingredient in the early church. And it's not just his presence, it's what he does when he shows up. And listen to what he does. It says, and when he came, he saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. That word that the ESV translates exhorted could also be translated encouraged. It's the word in the Greek, we'll talk about it in just a moment, parakaleo. And it could and has been, is translated encouraged on a number of different occasions. See, Barnabas is living up to his name. I love that the church doesn't just send somebody that can strategize. They don't send somebody, hey, go fix what's going on in Antioch. They don't send somebody that's going to be the best teacher in the world. No, who do they send? They send Barnabas. Why? Because a word of encouragement can be a catalyst to thriving. That's why they send Barnabas. Because a word of encouragement has the ability to change not just somebody's day, but the trajectory of somebody's life. So they cue Barnabas, son of encouragement. We need him at this crossroads moment. Remember, I told you that the word encourage in the Greek is, is the word parakaleo. It's from two words put together. It's a compound word. The first is para, and it means from close beside. The second word is kaleo, which means to call so look at what happens when somebody encourages another person. They, they call to them. They call them out. It's that um, idea that encouragement isn't something that's soft. You have to look at people in the eye and call them forward. You can't be weak and be an encourager. But it's also from close beside. You can't be unloving and be an encourager. You can't be uh, um, unrelational and be an encourager. It demands, it demands that you are both strong and connected to the other person. So you might be asking yourself, a word of encouragement can be a catalyst to thriving. Ryan, is encouragement really that big of a deal? Can it make that big of a difference in somebody's life can it be the seeds of thriving in the life of another well just look at the way that james talked about the power of words this is from the message paraphrase because i just love the way that it made this section of scripture pop but listen to james chapter 3 verses 3 through 5 it says this a bit in the mouth of a horse controls the whole horse a small rudder on a huge ship in the hands of a skilled captain sets a course in the face of the strongest winds. Those are, those are both um, analogies for what he really wants to talk about, which is this. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. Have you ever thought about the immense power that your words hold? I mean, you might even say that spoken words shape human worlds. <laughs> like seeds, they get planted inside of our head and our heart, and eventually they bear fruit. They can cause people to doubt or believe, to flounder or flourish, to fail or fly. And in speaking about the power of negative words, atheist John Paul Sartre said this. Here's what he said. He said, words are loaded pistols. You remember that old adage that used to fly around on playgrounds? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never. Okay, just by a show of hands. 
How many of you have ever been hurt by a word? Okay, so somebody lied to us. <laughs> Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? You don't need to raise your hands, but how many of you can still remember a word that was spoken to you years and years, maybe even decades ago, that just lodged in your heart or in your head? It's really interesting your brain is actually wired to remember harsh words. <laughs> that your amygdala uses approximately two-thirds of its neurons to detect negative words and negative experiences. And it lodges those words into your long-term memory almost immediately. By way of contrast, if somebody says something nice to you or kind or encouraging, you need to hold that thought for at least 12 seconds in order for it to get lodged into your long-term memory. Which is why you could go through a day and hear a number of compliments and pieces of encouragement and all somebody has to say is one negative thing and the whole day is off track. Anybody want to say amen to that? Yeah, it's just part of the way that we are wired. So think about our cultural moment right now. I mean, you turn on the news, you turn on a podcast... You swipe through social media. I mean, how much negativity is just surrounding us? When we're exploring this series and what to talk about when we talk about not so new, not so normal. And I saw Mother's Day right in the middle of this series. I thought about this text because I thought, you know what's, you know what's normal? is using words to tear people down. In a moment of outrage, we will say almost anything to feel like we're on top. You know what's not so new, not so normal? Barnabas. Encouraging, coming alongside of people to build them up and to push them forward. And to all the moms who are sitting in this space today. This is what you long for, isn't it? To be a woman who speaks life, who speaks truth, who comes alongside of your kids or alongside of your grandkids, who points them to Jesus and says to them, keep going. And here's the beautiful thing. We long for that and we're wired to need it. And so I think what God wants to do together is to bring both, our, both of our longings, our need for those words and our longing to give them together to say and paint a picture of what it looks like to move forward believing that a word of encouragement can be a catalyst to thriving. So look at the way that this plays out in the early church and the life of Barnabas. There's four things that Barnabas does because you know, it can be really easy to just say, hey, go be an encouragement. And a right response would be, how? What does that look like? I'm so glad you asked that. There's four things that that looks like in Acts chapter 11. Look at this. It says, the report, the report that God was doing a new thing in Antioch, came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And I thought, well, yeah, that's the perspective from Luke, who's writing this, it's the perspective of the church in Antioch. But if you're Barnabas, you would write this a little bit different, wouldn't you? They called for me, and I had to decide whether or not I was going to go. I heard it was a little bit messed up down there in Antioch. A little bit contentious. Had to pray about it a little bit. Yeah, they sent Barnabas, but Barnabas also had to decide to enter the tension. To enter the tension. See, encouragement is most needed in places we typically try to avoid. In fact, I, I would go so far as to say, if there is a situation you'd rather avoid, there's probably a person longing for encouragement. If you're going, gosh, I'm not sure I want to enter that mess. There's somebody who's waiting for you to enter it with a word of encouragement for them, 
to walk alongside of them. See, the people who need encouragement in the situations where encouragement is needed are times when we're discouraged, when we're depressed, when we're deconstructing, when we're doubting. And those conversations can be awkward. They can be challenging. Listen, it's easy to talk about the weather. It's easy to offer trite cliches. It's easy to ignore and change the subject. But I think what God is calling us to as a community of faith is to say, I will enter the tension. Even when I don't know what to say and I don't have all the answers, I'm going to do my best to enter with a word of encouragement because a word of encouragement can be a catalyst to thriving. But let's just name that that's not easy. One of my favorite times during my week is when our writing team meets to plan our daily filled devotions that come to your email inbox every single morning throughout the week if you sign up, which plug, plug, you should sign up. Um, One of our writers, when we were talking about this passage, his name's Jonathan Duncan, he made this statement during our writing time and I wrote it down and I told him, I'm going to use that in my sermon because I, I think that that captures it so beautifully. Here's what Jonathan said. Jonathan said, to be a true encourager, you need to know your way around sadness. And this is a man who has CP, who knows his way around sadness, but is also an encourager. And I think what he's saying is you can't be afraid of the darkness. You can't be afraid of the pain. You can't be afraid of not knowing the answers. You just got to step in. And God just might use you like he used Barnabas. So what's a situation you'd rather avoid? That Jesus might be inviting you to enter with a word of encouragement. Here's a second thing. Here's a second thing that Barnabas did. It says, and when he came, he, will you say these five words with me, Emmanuel Faith? He saw the grace of God and he was glad. What a picture of an encourager. See, an encourager has the ability to excavate grace. Like an archaeologist unearth bones that have been buried for generations, so too encouragers get to see the fingerprints of God on the lives of others and they call them out. Here's what I see God doing. Here's what God is up to. And we need people like that because we often can't see that in our own lives life. See, encouragers help people have their own aha moments. Do you know what I mean by that? Where they step back and go, gosh, I didn't see that. I didn't see that, God, you were at work in this situation. God, I didn't see that I've actually have been growing. <laughs> it's been so slow. Uh, God, I didn't see that you've brought about healing in that relationship. God, I just didn't have eyes to see it, but encouragers, oh, they come in and they go, oh, the fingerprints of God are all over this life. They're all over this situation. He's on the move. You've got to see it. You've got to see it. On this Mother's Day, when I think back on my mom and the part that she played in my life, She was an excavator of grace. Here's what I mean by that. I wasn't exactly an easy kid. Um, And my mom knew my flaws, maybe better than anyone at the time. But she also saw God's potential of what he might use my life for. And there were really key moments where I could have gone one way or another, where she could have come down really, really hard on me and would have all been accurate and all been true. But man, my mom was just the kind of mom that was able to see God's redemptive work is going on right here. And Ryan, God has a great plan for your life. Don't lose sight of it in the midst of all of your screw-ups, she would say to me. Right? <laughs> Praise be to God. For people like that. So to all the moms out there, I know you see your kids' flaws better than anyone. But my guess is you also see God's grace in their lives better than anyone. Speak it out. Let them know. Be one of those encouragers. And I love too that it says, if you go back and look at the text, I love that it says that Barnabas saw the grace of God and he was glad. Where he goes, oh, 
Lord, thank you. See, because to be an encourager, you have to be alongside, right? You've got to be close enough to be affected by somebody either growing or not growing. And Barnabas sees it and goes, praise be to God. That's amazing. That's awesome. And I love that Barnabas gets a little fired up when he sees God's grace at work. And the next thing he does, here's what he does. He exhorted or encouraged them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So he enters, he sees grace, and then he calls people to remain faithful. You know, as I was thinking about the New Testament epistles, these letters that were just floating back and forth to different churches from different authors in the first century that seemed like encouragement to remain faithful was one of the main themes. I mean, listen to the way that Paul wrote it to the church in Corinth. He said this, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord and knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. What's he doing? He's saying, come on you guys. Keep going. Remain faithful. Because we all get to points in our life where we would rather give up. Don't we? Yeah. Don't we? I mean, we just lived through 2020 and part of 2021 together. Right? We all get to points where we feel like, gosh, it would just be easier to give up or we lose sight of the greater goal or the purpose of what God is doing both in our lives and in his world or we feel like we don't have the strength to continue to go. And then it's at that point that God often uses Barnabas to come alongside of us and to inspire us to faithfulness. To inspire us to faithfulness. I mean, it might be a whisper in someone's ear, you have everything you need for life and godliness. Keep going. Keep going. It might be reminding somebody that they are known and valued by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That Jesus gave his life for them because he loved them. That God wired them together in their mother's womb. That they are fearfully and wonderfully made. It might be reminding somebody that God has a purpose for their life. But in every situation, it's reminding them and calling them to remain faithful. It might even be a strong word of saying, listen, if you have that affair, if you continue to go down that road, if you do this or that, you are going to lose the things that you care about most in this world. Because remember, encouragement isn't always soft. Sometimes it's a difficult conversation to inspire people towards faithfulness. This is what Barnabas does when he confronts the early disciples who are rejecting Paul. Come on, you guys. God's doing a great work. I know it's risky. I know he killed some of our friends. But God's fingerprints all, are all over it. Remain faithful to him. Most people know that Jackie Robinson was the first person to break the color barrier in Major League Baseball. What, what they may not know, though, is that Jackie would tell you that one of the reasons he was able to keep doing what he did was because of his wife, Rachel Robinson. It was her influence in their home and in Jackie's life that allowed him to endure the ridicule that he endured. And I love the way that Jackie once wrote about how inspiring his wife was to him. He said this, thinking about Rachel always makes me want to remind my girls and women how impart, important they are to making the world go round. <laughs> See, we all know what Jackie Robinson did, but many of us don't know that he would tell us the reason he was able to do it is because of Rachel's encouragement to him. How might you inspire faithful? You can't be faithful for anyone, but you can inspire faithfulness in someone. Here's one last thing that Barnabas did. It says this, so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. 
For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. I love this picture of Barnabas, son of encouragement. See, because he gets the church to a certain point and goes, I can't do this all on my own. See, encouragers don't need to wear the cape. They don't need to solve all the problems. They don't need to be the one that's on the tip of the spear or on the stage. They, they, in order to have influence, they don't need to have power. Do you know what encouragers do? They look for resources and then they pull them in. They resource people for growth. That's what encouragers do. I love that Barnabas says, you know what, I'm going to go get Paul. I'm going to bring him down here. Because that's what this church, this community of faith needs. So it might look like a few things. Let me give you a few ideas of what that might look like in our lives today. It might look like encouraging somebody to take a step of obedience that they're just resisting. They're going, I'm not sure I'm ready for that. How many of you, just by a show of hands, have had somebody come alongside of you and encourage you to do something you didn't think you were ready for? Yeah. Do you know what the name of that person was? Barnabas. They, they were an encourager. They were somebody coming alongside and saying, no, I think there's more in you. You can step into this. You can do it. But the second thing encouragers do is they speak honestly about areas of growth. They say, God, I think God's calling you into more in this area. So there might be people in your life who could really benefit from therapy or counseling or spiritual direction, and they don't even know that those things are a possibility and that they're out there, it may take a Barnabas to come alongside them and say, you can grow beyond this pain. It's resourcing people for growth. But the third thing, and this stood out to me when I was on my run on uh, last Friday. I was out at Kit Carson with my dog, and I was just running this loop. And there was this guy that just ran past me at a torrid pace. I mean, he looked like a gazelle, sort of like me. And, um, <laughs> and so I'm a little bit competitive, just a little bit. And so he dusts me, and I'm like, oh, no, you don't. And I grab my dog, and I'm like, come on, buddy. And so I start tearing after. He didn't know we were in a race, but we were in a race. He also doesn't know he won, but he won. And um, I got back to my car, and I looked at my watch, and although I didn't catch said gazelle man, um, it was my fastest mile. And I went, he was a Barnabas. <laughs> he pushed me. He didn't know it, but he, he encouraged me. And Paul will write, follow me as I follow Christ. That's what people who are encouragers do. Your words, friends, have power. Human words shape the world that we live in. They have the ability to catalyze people towards faithfulness and towards thriving. And I thought, man, I would love for you to hear from somebody who's heard a lot of stories about the way that words shape worlds. I'd like you to watch a video of my friend Kathy Morado, who's been a marriage and family therapist for over 30 years. She's on staff with us here at Emmanuel Faith, and I'd love for you to hear just a testimony from her about the way that words shape worlds. Hi, my name is Kathy Morado, and um, I've been doing marriage and family counseling for the last 30 plus years. The last 15 or so have been here at the church, and in that time, I've uh, learned a few things about our words. They are really powerful. The old adage about sticks and stones may break my bones and words will never hurt me is really not accurate because um, words can really hurt deeply. Especially in our day now with social media, we, um, we have bigger and louder platforms for our words. The thing is, hurtful words spawn more hurtful words. They don't stop. And the wounds that come from those hurtful words are real and they're painful. and. Um, they can be very long-lasting. 
Um, I know today is Mother's Day, and uh, I'd really like to speak to moms and dads. I was always fascinated by people coming in to do therapy in their 50s and 60s and 70s, and they were still desperately trying to win their parents' love and approval. They genuinely believed that they would not be whole, they would not be okay unless they had that love and approval. Um, and I began to realize just how vital and important parents' words to their kids were. God has given us parents tremendous power to shape and instill deeply entrenched beliefs in our kids, which they will take into adulthood. Uh, beliefs like, I am really worth loving just for being me. Or, no, I don't deserve to be loved at all. Or, I have value just for being myself. Or, no, I have to please and earn and perform to find any kind of significance in my life. Or, I matter in this life. Or, no, I don't. The picture that we paint of God is the primary source of understanding of Him for our kids. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems pretty daunting. Like, Lord, what are you thinking, right? That is the hope that I'm really wanting to share with you today, that we cannot do this parenting thing well without Him. But with Him, we certainly can. Um, so, I would encourage you, if you haven't begun already, to truly be seeking Him every day, asking for His help so that we can be empowered by Him to fulfill the sacred trust that He's given to each one of us as parents. He welcomes that. He wants that. Some of you may be thinking, well, that's just great. Glad to hear that now. Um, I've already blown it. It's, it's a lost cause. It's too late. Let me just tell you, it is not too late. There is hope. There is grace upon grace upon grace from our Heavenly Father. He will give us the power and the desire to use our words well, which brings life to others and ultimately to ourselves too. So that to me brings great hope. Thanks for letting me share and uh, happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there and happy Mother's Day to you, mom. I love that last part. I loved it all, Kathy, so thank you. But uh, that last piece of encouragement that, wow, I mean, if you feel like you're here today and you're going, I just, I haven't lived that out. I, I, I haven't excavated grace. I haven't entered the mess. I haven't inspired faithfulness. I, I, God, I, I, I haven't done those things. I just want to encourage you. I've been praying this whole week that the enemy's lie of condemnation would not be the seed that you hear today. But that if you're going, hey, I haven't lived that out well, like Kathy said, this is not the end of the story. You can step in and by God's grace, you can ask for forgiveness. You can start becoming an encourager. You can do this by God's grace. You can start using your words to build up and God will use them as seeds of thriving in the lives, not just of your kids, but of all the people that you get to interact with. And you know what encouragers are? Encouragers are simply echoing the voice of God. That, that's what they're doing. I mean, look at all the things we've talked about this morning. The encouragers enter the mess. That's exactly what Jesus did on our behalf. Encouragers excavate grace. Well, Jesus doesn't excavate grace. He brings grace. He breathes grace. They inspire faithfulness. Well, it's God's faithfulness to us that is, any that is our foundation of faithfulness to him. They inspire, challenge us to grow. And it's God by his grace who allows us to continue to grow as his 
followers. And I love this last little section in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. It said this, and in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. And I just had to wonder how much Barnabas's impact and encouragement shaped this church, who they called little Christs. People who took on the character of Jesus. How much did God use those words and actions of Barnabas in the lives of the early church? Uh, it's not so new. It's definitely not so normal. But friends, it is our invitation today. And I think God is inviting all of us to be encouragers. So this week you could send a text message. You could send a note. You could make a phone call. You could set up a lunch or a coffee with somebody and just listen to their story and see how you might be able to speak a word of encouragement into it. You want to be an encouragement to this church body? Our kids ministry needs about 20 volunteers to continue to serve over 250 kids every single weekend. And you know what each one of those volunteers gets to do? Guess. Encourage. 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 They get to call somebody alongside them and say, God has great things in store for you. And you know what? If you do that, if you step into this role of being an encourager, God's going to encourage you also. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 25 says, whoever refreshes others will himself be refreshed. So as we close, would you just open your hands to God? Say, God, I'm open to you. Would you ask him right now how he might be inviting you to live this message out? If you're one of the moms who's joining us today, either in person or online, I just want to invite you to think back on ways that you have encouraged. Ways you've lived this out. Because you have. You have. It's sometimes easier to recall the times we failed, but you've lived this out. Your kids' lives are different because of your words in a really good way. And then for all of us, would you just ask Jesus what it would look like this week for you to step into the role of a Barnabas, an encourager? God, it's humbling to think that we might be the, the secret ingredient, empowered by your spirit and by your grace, but that you might use us to be the secret ingredient in somebody's thriving and their flourishing. God, I pray that when we encounter people who are at a crossroads, that we might speak life, that we might speak love, that we might speak hope, that we might speak peace, that we might be encouragers, not just soft, but in challenging situations that we would step in with a strong word, but that you would use us in the lives of others to help them move more towards the life that you died to give them. Lord, thank you for every single person in this room. I lift up the moms especially. May they know your grace in their life today. May they feel the appreciation for the many ways that they sacrifice for their kids and for their families. May they hear your whisper, well done, well done, and keep going. Jesus, thank you for being such an encouragement to us. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.